I recall back when I was a kid growing up on a farm in Kentucky, how I grew to love water just by fishing on a creek on a, my grandparents' uh, farm. And I really developed a passion <clears throat> for water. And I would hope that today, maybe, perhaps one of you may choose to take a career in, in water supply or water management. Uh, but if not, though, I think there's all of us play a role in what we can do to help conserve water and manage our resources wisely. We heard earlier about the water cycle and how you know water's been on this planet forever and we use the same water that's been here. It just goes through a cycle. Our job as water managers is how do we manage that resource when it's here, if it, when it falls as rain water? How do we manage it? How do we make sure that there's adequate supply for all the beneficial uses that there are in the state? And then how do we protect the environment? Because we want to make sure that this is whatever we do is sustainable and that we'll have this resource for generations to come. Now, I don't know if you can see this picture, but it really it's I got this off a of USGS website. And see the big bubble over the western United States? That bubble is the volume of water that's on the planet. And you would think, oh, there's plenty of water. That is the total volume of water on Earth. Now that is about, it's a, if you look at it as a huge sphere, it would be about an 860 mile diameter or a sphere. Now there's another bubble that you can see right over Kentucky. Uh, that is the amount of fresh water that's on Earth. The same volume, that's about 170 mile diameter sphere. That is the amount of water on the whole planet that we have to work with in terms of managing fresh water. Now there's another bubble that you probably, I don't know if you can see this or not, but it's right over, kind of over Georgia. You see that right about there? That is the total volume of surface water, water in river and lakes that we have on Earth. So when you think about that, and that's about a 35 mile diameter bubble of water. So what an enormous responsibility. How do we manage these resources to make sure that it will be a viable source for, you know, the environment will have enough water and the people and industry will have enough water. But it's a fundamental precept of Florida water law is that we must ensure that there's adequate supply to meet the reasonable beneficial uses that are out there, ag, public supply, industrial, all the people that need water and industries, but also make sure that we're protecting the environment. And here's kind of a, a map that shows kind of the principal aquifers. We rely heavily on groundwater in this state. Now that's changing as we're going more to surface water and desalination has become a source uh, that we've heard about today. But this little uh, line that you see up in this area that meanders through the northern part of the state, that's what we call the hydrologic divide. So all the water that flows or that hits south of that line is what we rely on here in this part of the state. This, you've, sometimes you may have heard, oh, there's an underground groundwater source that provides adequate, so we don't really need to worry, no. The water uh, in this area where we are today relies on the rainfall that comes down. So that, that's the source of water that we have here in this part of the state. And we heard earlier from uh, Ms. Barnett about how many lakes there are. I mean, we are, we are so blessed to have an abundant number of resources in this state. So our job as water managers is how do we protect that? We have seven, seven, over 7,000 lakes over 12,000 miles of streams where the surface water flows into either the Atlantic or the Gulf. We have the over 700 springs, 27 are first magnitude. That means they on average flow over 100 cubic feet per second. That's about 65 million gallons per day. And over 200 second magnitude springs, and those are springs from 10 cubic feet per second up to 100. So we see that there are problems with our springs, but we have to continue 
to manage those to make sure that we're protecting those resources. And we do that through like the surface waters through setting minimum flows and levels so that we can set those protective levels so that any flows that were, or any withdrawals would not cause significant harm to those resources. Now these are the beaches and I'm sure we all like the beaches, right? So those beaches are about 825 miles in this state, but that's only about 10% of the total detailed shoreline that we have, including all the estuaries, the rivers that flow in, that have salt water exposure. So we must do our job to protect these resources, not just the beaches, but all the estuaries as well. Now I know you can't read all of this, but I'll try to summarize this for you. And this is basically how water is managed in the state of Florida. I work for a water management district, and my district runs from Levy County down to Charlotte County on the west coast of Florida. It covers about, <clears throat> excuse me, 16 counties, a little over 5 million people live in this area. We're one of five water management districts. Mr. Bartol is going to talk to you after me, and he's going to talk to you about the St. John's District and a little more detailed information about what's going on there. But we are managed, actually, over, there's oversight provided by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So we sort of report to those folks, uh, and then we help manage the resource. Now, one of the things that's unique in the Southwest District is we have regional water supply authorities. Now those authorities actually are huge wholesale water suppliers and what that does is it enables utilities to kind of work together so that when we develop projects that are more expensive like seawater desalination, surface water, huge reservoirs to store water during the wet season and also aquifer storage recovery type projects. We can do those much more economically if we can do larger scale projects. So we're working with regional water supply authorities so that we can generate the benefits of those economies of scale and also provide more management of those resources. So authorities who have multiple sources of water can rotate those. What you may hear in uh, the water supply terms, it's called conjunctive use where you rotate those pumpages to minimize these environmental impacts. So during a drought, when the water supplies are low, you would lean on your desalination projects. When the summer, you know, when we get a lot of rainfall in the summer, then we would use reservoirs to store that water and then provide that as a, an alternative to groundwater. And then groundwater can be an alternative too that we have to lean on at times. But having multiple alternatives, I think, is really critical. And that plays a role in the whole water portfolio with conservation and also with reclaimed water that I'll talk a little bit about in just a moment. So how much water do we use just in my district, the Southwest District? How much water do you think we use a day? Like a million gallons a day? or How many think a billion gallons a day? It's a billion gallons a day. And how, let's just try to get a handle on how much water is that. So if an average swimming pool is about 20,000 gallons, then how much is a billion gallons? How, how many swimming pools do you think? You've got, got your calculators on you? It would be about 50,000 swimming pools a day of water is used. So we really, I mean, it's what a huge responsibility. How do we manage that in the best way to make sure there's supply available for, for the public and for industry and for agriculture? And then how do we protect the environment? So it really is a tremendous responsibility that we have. And one of the things that we're doing in the Southwest District is promoting the use of reclaimed water. Ms. Barnett referred to this about uh, how important it is for us to be able to use our wastewater. And in our district, and there's a lot of numbers here, but I want to point you to this highlighted area, which says nearly 10% of all district water use is reuse. And this is an incredible accomplishment that I'm really proud of what we've done. 
That is one out of every 10 gallons that makes those billion gallons a day of demand in this district is met by reclaimed water. And that includes a lot of that for uh, public supply. A lot of it's used for irrigation instead of using high quality drinking water for irrigation. We're using reclaimed water. So that number is going to continue to increase over time. And the map here shows that just in our district alone, we have more reuse than all these other states that are highlighted. So it's pretty phenomenal what we've accomplished, I think. And there's, there's a lot more work to be done, but gaining more acceptance and utilization of reclaimed water is really a key part of the water solution for the future. And I think as you grow up and uh, in your future, you're going to see that become more and more of a, a valued resource uh, for, for the state of Florida and for the world, for that matter. And I'll leave you with this. I, you, you heard about I was involved with the seawater desalination project. I actually managed that project. Uh, and I can tell you I learned a lot about water supply and gained a real appreciation for conservation because I have lived through the challenges of developing these types of projects. Uh, this project certainly went through a lot of challenges. It was, it's the largest seawater desalination plant in the United States. And we went through, you, you may have read about it in the newspapers and heard about it. But this plant is working now and it's actually uh, producing about 20 million gallons per day uh, now. So the one thing I'll leave you with in terms of you know, my message is we really have to conserve our resource. And, and believe me, I've learned about the risks of developing these other types of projects. And these are projects that we're going to continue to need, I believe, in the future. But if we do our part, if you do your part in conserving water, and there's a lot of things that, that we can do. And there's just a few listed here, like shorter showers. You know, my kids, I have to sometimes beat on, you know, all right, that's all, you know, I wish I could put a timer on it, but uh, wash only full loads of laundry, as an example. Turn off the water while brushing your teeth. A lot of you probably are doing this, and, and that really does save water. And minimizing lawn irrigation, that's a real key. I mean, in our district, we see that a significant amount of water is used for irrigation, so we're looking at ways to better, you know, uh, utilize resources and conserve water that's used outdoors through like Florida friendly landscape, uh, also using reclaimed water, uh, soil moisture sensors, there's a lot of new technology that's out there that we believe can help uh, conserve water uh, that's used outdoors. So with that I'll conclude and I uh, appreciate your attention this morning. I'm Tom Bartol. I'm from the St. John's River Water Management District. Um, actually, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. If I wasn't here, actually, Ken and I would be at a meeting in Orlando with 30 or 40 engineers and scientists arguing over water management issues. So this is actually a welcome uh, uh, respite from that. Um, Ken and I had kind of planned these presentations. Um, I'm from the St. John's River Water Management District, and if you think of from the Georgia border down to Gainesville, Orlando, Vero Beach, and up the East Coast, 18 county area, uh, 4.7 million people, and we have um, about 25% of the population in the land mass of the state of Florida. Um, my presentation can talk general about water management and water issues. I'm going to move to something more specific and give you an example of what we're doing to protect the water resources and ensure we meet future demands. So I'm answering the question, what are you doing to ensure that we protect these water resources and, and have enough water for the future? Um, I'm going to talk about, let me back up, I'm going to talk about something called the Central Florida Water Initiative. Um, it's right here in Orlando. It uh, covers about three million people, people in the greater Orlando area. And we have an initiative going on. We've been working on it for two or three years to ensure that we protect the water resources of Central Florida. Um, what is this initiative? Well, first of all, it's a collaborative process. 
And the opposite of a co collaborative process is some of the things that we've seen in Florida happen before, for example, in the greater Tampa area, where we had legal battles and we argued about water in court for eight or ten years. And after those eight or ten years did not provide any more water. What they did was they argued who was to blame and how we're going to get out of this situation. Collaborative process is we work together with water suppliers and interest groups and environmental groups to determine to ensure that we protect the water resources and we can meet, meet those demands. For the Central Florida water area, we have uh, technical collaborative teams. I'm going to show you that. It's all going to come together in a water supply plan. Uh, and um, never been done before for this greater Orlando area, we're going to have three water management districts, the three biggest ones in the state, do a single water, water supply plan for these three million people in the greater Orlando area. Um, this is a map of the Central Florida water uh, initiative area and I wanted to highlight these yellow these red lines because those are the water management districts and to the west you have the southwest water management district which Ken is from to the south you have the south Florida water Ma management district goes all the way down to Miami covers that whole uh, large area of Palm Beach and uh, Broward and Miami-Dade County and then we have St. John's to the northeast this is the only part of the area where we have these three large water management districts in an urban, somewhat urban area competing for resources and in the past we all did things a little differently. We have our own rules, we have our own regulations, we have our own processes and what we heard in Central Florida is uh, you guys need to get together and start working together so that we have a consistent process and collaborate with stakeholders to ensure that we protect these water resources. So um, the Central Florida water area is six counties, Polk County, Orange County, Osceola County, uh, Seminole County, and part of Lake County. Um, so what are we doing, what, what are you guys doing with this Central Florida Water Initiative? The first thing is, is we're identifying sustainable quantities of groundwater for water supply without causing unacceptable harm to water resources. So my job, what I do day in and day out, is to make sure we protect water resources, but when you all go home and you turn your faucets on, that water comes out, and that your families can meet the needs, the daily needs, of your residences and family members, uh, and that there's enough water for everybody. Secondly, we're trying to develop strategies to meet demands that are in excess of sustainable groundwater. And I get asked a lot, is there enough Flor water in Florida? Is, do you have enough groundwater? And my answer is, we are approaching the limits of sustainable groundwater now. And that in some areas, we are probably at those limits, but certainly to meet the future needs, we need to do things differently, certainly in St. John's River Water Management District, to make sure that we can meet those future needs. And then finally, a guiding principle here is to have consistent rules and regulations. And this, again, has never been done before. We're going to end up here. Everybody in the greater Orlando area is going to have one rule and one way to both get water allocations and how we uh, look at the limitations to that. Um, how are we doing this? We have a steering committee. We have a steering committee com uh, com uh, comprised of all water users. We have agriculture, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. We have the utilities uh, on the steering committee and water management districts. And then we have various oversight groups. We have um, a, the meeting, one of the meetings that Ken and I are missing right now is the groundwater availability team meeting. And we're looking at, in central Florida, is there enough groundwater to meet the future demands? And we have engineers and scientists, and we're looking at how are the wetlands going to be affected? How are the springs going to be affected from these groundwater withdrawals? And then the last team there is the one that I'm leading up is the water supply plan team. I'm going to talk a little bit with you on water supply planning. Um, this is just an organization chart. I'm not going to, not going to spend much time with this. Um, 
What are the themes that we're talking about? Again, we wanted to get out in Central Florida, we wanted to get out of this legal framework for water supply and meeting future demands. Can we do this jointly, collaboratively? And that's what we've been doing with all of these teams that we're working on. We want to have uh, not three definitions of harm from the three water management districts, but one. We wanted to have one groundwater model, which is the first time we've done that. And again, I said this before, we're going to have a water supply plan, uh, one single water supply plan. Um, the groundwater availability team is the meeting Ken and I are missing right now, and we are, act we are looking at, is there enough groundwater to meet future demands, and have, uh, have uh, it ha are there too many permits out there in Central Florida to meet those uh, water resource needs? So we do this through very technical groundwater modeling, et cetera, which I can answer some questions on that. Um, and then finally, how, what do you do with these two years of meetings and all these teams that you're working on? We do what's called a regional water supply plan. Again, we're doing one of them for Central Florida. Um, we're writing this ourselves, and we're writing it right now. And a water supply plan is very foundational to water management. And what the water supply plan does is we project demands out 20 years. So right now we're working at 2035. And we say, how many people are there going to be in Central Florida in 2035? And how does that translate into an amount of water? And then we look at the water resources with those demands and determine whether the wetlands will still be healthy, whether the springs will still be flowing, uh, whether the lake levels will still be appropriate to maintain those water resources. Um, another thing I want to talk about is we look in this water supply plan about conservation potential. And conservation has, is it a very important element in our water supply planning. Um, in the greater Orlando area, the CFWI area I was talking about, since 1995 to 2010, water use is relatively constant in this area, even though population has increased significantly. And one of the reasons that that's happened is because we see great strides made in water conservation. Um, Water supply plan, and you all are invited to participate in this. We will have public meetings, we'll have workshops, we have a website. If those of you are interested for the CFWI, it's CFWI Water. You can Google that and you can see the meetings, what our public meetings will be, et cetera. Um, and um, we also have means to uh, have people uh, tell us they're interested in getting emails and significant facts, et cetera, about the S Central Florida Water Initiative. And then finally, where are we right now? We are just getting the output of this groundwater model that we've been working on for years. Um, and we are doing the water resource evaluation right now. And what that means is we're, we're seeing from those future demands um, is there enough water for the wetlands and the lakes and springs? And we'll be doing that uh, evaluation between now and, and May. And then we will have a draft regional water supply plan um, by the end of this year. So let me just com conclude a couple of key points. Um, I mentioned this before that I believe we're reaching the limits of uh, sustainable gro groundwater resources right now. Um, conservation is making a huge difference and um, there are m many ways individually you can get involved with water conservation. Um, uh, in the greater Orlando area, I hear this a lot by the way, that what's the problem Florida is not growing? Well, we have statistics that show in the greater Orlando area between now and uh, 2035 the population will grow 50% from 2.7 million to 4.1 million in this great six county greater Orlando area. So our job as water suppliers is to ensure that we can meet those demands and we want to do it in an environmentally acceptable way. And then finally, Ken mentioned this um, in St. John's for example, we produce about 300 million gallons a day of wastewater. 
And of that, over half of that is reclaimed and reused for irrigation and commercial purposes. So we're getting very good at reclaiming those water resources and reusing them for a second time. And that concludes my presentation, and I'll be available for questions. I'm also honored to be sitting here with two other colleagues and hope that you will leave here today not wondering if there will be enough water, um, but instead that you'll have a better understanding how all the water user groups, municipal, municipalities, agriculture, and the environment are working together in a cohesive fashion to make sure that there will be ample water for all uses. Let me start briefly by informing you who I represent. As you have heard in the introductions, I serve as a director for Florida Farm Bureau Federation. We are the voice of agriculture in Florida with a membership of 150,000 who produce and raise much of the food that you eat each and every day. And in fact, I would imagine that your stomachs are thinking about that right now. <laughs> Florida produces over 300 different crops on 47,500 farms that encompass 9.25 million acres. Most people don't think of Florida as an agricultural state because they don't see rows and rows of beans or corn or other cultivated crops. Yet when you're driving down Florida's turnpike and you're looking across the Palmetto Flats and occasional pastures, you're looking at Florida agriculture. We take agriculture and feeding the population of the nation and the world very seriously. With today's successful commercial agriculture, one U.S. farmer produces enough to food to feed 155 people and is the leading producer of more than 50 foods of importance to diets throughout the world. Agriculture in the United States and therefore Florida is blessed with abundant natural resources, significant investment in private and public agricultural research, and, most and the most advanced agricultural technology in the world, placing it in the best position to drive total global food supply. So how does all this apply to the question of this panel's uh, topic of water supply in Florida? Adequate water is an indispensable requirement to growing any crop, be it plant or animal. Just as we all require a certain amount of water to live, so does an agricultural crop. And when it is hot and dry, the crop requires an additional amount of water to live, again, just as we do. Our water supply is rain driven and with an average annual rainfall of over 50 inches per year, therefore it is easy for one to conclude that we have plenty of water and there's that just no problem. The problem lies in the fact that the majority of that rain falls between June and November. So the task that we have before us is not so much of do we have enough water, but instead, how do we handle the blessing that we get from the skies that, and make sure that we have sustainable water uh, that we're given? The answer falls into two categories, one that I'm sure that you are all aware of, and the other may, uh, may possibly be a new topic to you. The category that you're familiar with is conservation. Hopefully, it is part of your psyche. It certainly has become part of the psyche of farmers, Florida farmers, since the early 1980s, when in cooperation with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, as well as the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and sound peer-reviewed science developed by the University of Florida, farmers were introduced to best management practices, or BMPs, to help them use less water. This is accomplished by ha having a better understanding of the exact needs of a crop for the growing conditions such as the soil type and microclimate, then applying the exact amount of water needed, but no more. Additionally, because the water is primarily drawn into the plant through the root system, farmers learned how to apply the water where the roots are located 
through the incorporation of low volume irrigation systems. As time goes on, we continue to depend on the science developed by our land grant university system to better hone in on the te techniques that we use. Many irrigation systems around the state are computer controlled, sensing the field or water holding capacity of the soil. The weather conditions, such as temperature and relative humidity, and incorporating climate projection data uh, that will delay an irrigation cycle if rainfall is predicted for that day. What is holding some farming operations back from using the most up-to-date techniques is the mighty dollar. New technology is very expensive. And as you know with computers, as soon as you purchase it, it is out of date. Nonetheless, Florida Farm Bureau is working with our growers and ranchers to find ways to incorporate the newest technology on their farms and ranches. We are also working with the Department of Agriculture to make sure that farmers and ranchers are educated on the newest water saving methods. Besides conservation, the other category that is vital to sustainable water supply is water storage. Since we have an, a, ma a massive amount of rain <clears throat> that falls over a five to six month period, how can we store more of this water and reduce the runoff to our estuaries, gulf, and ocean, where volumes of fresh water discharge also create salinity and dissolved oxygen problems that harm the environment? It is important for agriculture to be on the forefront of this area because so much of this rain falls on agricultural croplands and pastures. 50 inches of, of annual rainfall on a single acre of land produces 1,357,700 gallons of water. Again, through sound peer-reviewed science developed by the University of Florida, as well as our tremendous water management districts, we have found ways to store water on croplands and pastures. One method of water storage you don't see even if you're looking at the field because it is taking place beneath the soil surface. By adding a board or two into a culvert that takes the water off of the field, the level of the water in the soil profile is raised, thus holding the water in the field. This isn't as easy as it sounds though because a level slightly too high will cause roots to rot in a saturated soil. Still, every gallon saved is a gallon that is not discharged to the sea. Another new concept is payment for water storage where a farmer enters into a long-term agreement with the water management district to set aside some acreage where water will be stored. If this takes place in an areas of a farm or a ranch where productivity tends to be lower, this becomes a viable alternative for the farmer. This model is actively expanding in South Florida and is seriously being considered in other parts of the state. A common misconception is to look at the size of an agricultural's water, uh, of size of agriculture's water permits and then assume that all of that water is being used each year by the farmer. The permit quantities are based on an amount that can be used per day, and our permitted amounts are based on drought conditions when we need the irrigated water the most. Yet, if it is raining, the farmer isn't using any water, and, it is being, and as it is being supplied by, by the sky. It is safe to say that then for every gallon that is not used in an agricultural water permit, that gallon is used by the environment, which pleases us because we have to be dynamic environmentalists if we wish to remain on the land that we love. So how can we ensure that there will be an ample water supply for Florida's future? We must work in a cooperative and collaborative effort that embraces sound peer-reviewed science and is not reactive to mix, uh, misconceptions. Taking any other course of action wastes valuable resources such as time, energy, and money, and ultimately 
uh, waste are one of our most precious resources, and that is water. Thank you. We talked a lot about uh, water. However, we should probably discuss uh, fertilizers and, and stuff as well because uh, much of the runoff is polluted due to all the fertilizers. What are you guys doing to eliminate those problems? I think that's coming up actually on the agenda to address water quality. Um, usually on the water supply side, we focus on water quantity, but certainly water quality is a very important thing that we do in the water management districts that uh, Department of Agriculture deals with also. Um, and we actually we have a whole other permitting program to make sure that you don't overwater, you don't, um, et cetera, use too many, too many uh, fertilizers that do get into the waterways. Yeah, and, and actually in regards to agriculture, and again, this may be discussed a little more in just a bit when the water quality is being discussed, those BMPs that I talked about in, in putting the, the targeting the, the water to a particular, to the root zone, we're doing the same thing with any nutrients that we're applying uh, through leaf and soil analysis, finding out exactly what that crop needs, and then applying just the amount of fertilizer or nutrients to that crop to grow the crop, and again, not applying too much water, you will keep that keep runoff from occurring to the crop. And just to reiterate what Tom said too, uh, you know, through conservation, I think is critical part of that. Just knowing that you're not applying too much water, especially during the wet season, if folks are fertilizing, then a lot of times, you know, some local governments are actually restricting fertilization during the wet season when there's a lot of rain, you know, that tends to run off during those times. So just through really responsible uh, conservation, not using too much water on your uh, turf for uh, public water supply purposes can play a role in reducing that uh, nutrient runoff. I'm a chaperone with Kennedy Middle School. Um, I have a question for you. Earlier and just a few minutes ago, you said that to conserve water and everything, we, should, we have our own days, certain days for residents. Do farmers have the same guidelines? Do they have certain days that they can water their crops? Or, or is it just the residents who have private homes and private businesses that only can do it on certain days? That's a, that's a great qu question. And, and no, we do not have that same kind of program because again uh, the, the requirements of the crop are, are, are different. What we do have is, is water management districts can, can uh, uh, formalize uh, restrictive measures where we are, have to cut back a certain amount total uh, for our, our usage. You know, uh, depend, depending on the, the drought severity, uh, they, they have the capability of cutting, cutting the, the volumes back of the amount that we use. Um, I, you know, I was very struck by that figure that we have, what, a 29, 39 dead springs in the state of Florida. And my question um, is in connection with this CPWI, this water management plan that you, you all are developing. Are you going to establish, have you considered establishing minimum flow levels for certain springs? Uh, that's one question. Another is that do you, have you considered limiting uh, extractive permits such as the one you granted to uh, Niagara recently until you get this all worked out? Um, well, the answer to your first question is uh, not only are we considering minimum flows on springs, we have minimum flows on springs. <coughs> as a matter of fact, in the Wakaiva system, all of the major springs have minimum flows and levels on them. And we, want, we monitor the spring flow daily from remote sensing uh, to make sure that those springs have enough flow. And so um, there are eight of them up there, including Wakaiva Spring, including uh, Miami Rock, et cetera. Um, we have other springs that we are continuing to set more minimum flows and levels on to assure that um, we maintain that spring flow. Um, uh, your last, your second part of your question is, um, I think, a permitting question. On yeah, what I ask is, until you figure this, you got this plan in place, have you considered limiting extractive permits to, uh, you know, where it's not absolutely essential, to, to companies such as Niagara and water bottling companies or the 
billionaires from Canada who want uh, uh, to uh, irrigate their pastures? Sure. Um, well, we have water management plans already. Um, in this area. The last one that St. John's did was in 2005, Southwest Florida does. There are limitations in those water management plans for future withdrawals. So we take that, when we issue a permit, I know in St. John's when we issue a permit, we look at such things as is there enough water to meet the needs of the environment? Would this permit adversely affect a wetland? And certainly we're right now, one of the examples you just gave, we're looking at a permit for a uh, cattle operation near Silver Springs and we're, we're, we are looking to ensure that the future spring flow is adequate for that system. So we do look at those um, and these minimum flows and levels you mentioned are a very important criteria in our permitting process. If I could just add to that, in the Southwest District, we are in the process of saying we have established minimum flows and levels for some springs, and we're going through that currently. We're actually going through that for the Chaskowitzka, Homosassa Springs area. And that is really important because when those minimum flows are established, then we can use our resources to evaluate permits to make sure those permits don't adversely affect or put those springs into a point where they'll be below their minimum flows. And that also the, the process does include recovery strategy for those springs that may not be meeting the minimum flows and we're required by law to develop recovery strategies for those so that you know different resources can be put in place to help reestablish those flows. So we're, we definitely value the uh, establishment of those uh, minimum flows and protect, as a protective measure for the springs. Um, there is not a recovery strategy for Silver Spring because there's no minimum flow and level on Silver Spring yet. We have a draft minimum flow and level out there um, that we're going to try to get adopted in the near future. But that spring did not have a minimum flow and level on it. We've done all the science and uh, the draft <coughs> document is out for review right now for that. Um, um, my recollection is that there will have to be a, not a recovery strategy, but a prevention strategy. That, spr that spring is meeting its MFL or proposed MFL right now, but we realize if we took growth out 20 years, it would not be meeting its MFL. So we will have to develop a strategy in the near future to ensure that that spring flow continues. I'm getting the uh, sign that our, we're out of time, so uh, we'll have to end here. Uh, Thank you to our guests. I appreciate it.